Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this presentation um, where we are going to be talking about United Nations peacekeeping. And uh, today we're presenting a data set um, of tasks uh, which appear in uh, UN peacekeeping mandates. And um, I'm very happy uh, to welcome uh, my co-authors uh, on this project. Um, and uh, today we have uh, uh, Jessica Di Salvatore, who is Associate Professor in Political Science and Peace Studies at, uh, the, at, at the University of Warwick. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Magnus Lundgren, uh, Associate Professor in Political Science at the University of Gothenburg. And we have uh, Hannah Schmidt, uh, who is the Head of Research Area on International Security, Peace and Conflict at the University of Zurich. And uh, um, the goal of our presentation today uh, is to discuss uh, this uh, new data set that we have created, uh, which has coded the tasks assigned to peacekeeping mandates of uh, UN peacekeeping operations uh, in Africa, um, covering uh, pretty much all of the post-Cold War period, starting in 91 and uh, going up to uh, 2000 and and um, 17. And in general, in the policy literature and uh, the academic literature as well, there has been a lot of the a, a lot of discussion about the changing uh, character um, uh, of uh, peacekeeping. And uh, at the beginning of this presentation, I will talk a little bit about um, the decision making process behind peacekeeping mandates. And I will talk about some of the major changes uh, in the practice of peacekeeping before we get into more detailed discussion of how tasks have actually changed over time, which is something that our data set uh, will hopefully uh, illuminate. And uh, in terms of housekeeping, um, our presentation will hopefully not exceed 40 minutes, which will leave ample time uh, for uh, online seminar. And uh, uh, this presentation is being recorded. So I hope that everyone is okay with that and it will be uploaded so people can view it uh, later as well. And uh, both the presentation and the questions and answers uh, session will be recorded. And uh, um, if you want to ask a question from, um, uh, uh, um, you know, on any topic related to our presentation uh, to any of the panelists, uh, please use the Q&A box. Um, I hope you can all see it um, on your screen and uh, uh, um, after we have completed our presentation, uh, I will moderate the questions and answers uh, session, and um, we will try to answer all of your questions um, if we have time. So please use the Q&A box uh, instead of the chat box, because it will be easier for me uh, to moderate. Um, okay, all right. So uh, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, I will start this presentation by discussing some of the major changes uh, in the practice of peacekeeping, as well as peacekeeping decision making. Yeah, so um, um, I have found some uh, um, photos which illustrate how peacekeeping has changed from its Cold War origins to its contemporary shape and form. So on the picture uh, uh, on the left, we can see a peacekeeper in the UN uh, peacekeeping operation in Cyprus. Uh, in uh, the year 1965. And we can see that uh, this peacekeeper is uh, manning an observation point. Uh, he has a binocular, uh, he is lightly armed. Uh, he is engaging in what uh, peacekeepers would call static guard duty. And uh, the main um, goal of such operations was uh, monitoring, observing, and reporting on various developments. And Cold War operations were usually deployed in interstate conflicts. Of course, there have been exceptions. Uh, the practice of peacekeeping has never been uniform, but most peacekeeping operations during the Cold War followed this model, which is usually called the traditional peacekeeping model. And we can see that uh, um, the goal of those operations was uh, uh, confidence building between parties that have signed uh, a ceasefire agreement, sometimes a peace agreement. And on the picture on the right, we see 
um, as a contemporary form of um, peacekeeping. And to be honest, I would probably not even know that it was a peacekeeping operation. Uh, these are Canadian forces deployed in Mali. And uh, we can see that everything has changed. Uh, their gear has changed. Uh, they are much more heavily armed. Uh, they operate as cohesive units. They rely on various assets, uh, technological assets, aviation assets. And we know that in Mali, peacekeepers uh, engage in what is called robust operations. They operate in a difficult environment. They face various types of threats, threats from armed groups, threats from um, improvised explosive devices. Uh, and it's just, just a very di different peacekeeping uh, setting. And I think these two pictures um, illustrate that uh, the tasks, objectives, mandates of peacekeeping operations um, have really changed over time. Uh, but we have found that this discussion about peacekeeping becoming more robust or more multidimensional has lacked specificity because we know that peacekeeping has changed, but we haven't had a comprehensive overview of how peacekeeping uh, has changed. And of course, many of those changes have happened in the post-Cold War period. Uh, many of the tasks which emerged um, at the end of the Cold War, uh, focusing on supporting transitions to democracy, focusing on elections, uh, focusing on engagement with the civilian population, uh, they have really grown uh, in terms of their number and diversity uh, over the last uh, 30 years. And of course, peacekeeping remains um, a military affair at its heart. But at the same time, the number of various civilian tasks has increased. And on these pictures, we can see that peacekeepers engage in a wide variety of activities besides uh, the task that military components do. Although some of those um, tasks are also responsibility of military components. So on the picture on the left, uh, we can see peacekeepers again in Mali delivering a training uh, on mine awareness. And various activities related uh, to uh, demining have been a persistent feature of peacekeeping operations uh, throughout the post-Cold War era. But this is just one type of training that peacekeepers deliver to the civilian population. Uh, there are also other kinds of uh, training and education um, and engagement and confidence building at the local level that peacekeepers can engage in. And then there are two pictures on the right. Um, and uh, the picture on top uh, is a picture of a journalist from uh, the radio station in the Central African Republic, which is run by a peacekeeping mission. And uh, since the UN mission in Cambodia, many peacekeeping operations have had uh, a radio station, which can be a very effective tool in terms of spreading awareness of the mission itself um, and of the peace process. And on the picture on the bottom, we can see uh, military peacekeepers uh, guarding a polling station in the Central African Republic, and uh, it is a part of their electoral security mandate, um, which has also become an important element of peacekeeping. And we, have, we will talk in uh, more detail about patterns in various tasks assigned to, to peacekeeping mandates. But before we do that, I would like to say a few words about how peacekeeping mandates are negotiated. So uh, peacekeeping mandates are negotiated by the UN Security Council, which is one of the principal organs of the United Nations. Uh, it's a body that consists of five permanent members, the US, the UK, France, Russia, and China, and 10 non-permanent members that serve uh, two-year terms on the council and they are elected. And the UN Security Council collectively uh, initiates peacekeeping operations. It can make a decision to launch a new peacekeeping operation, it also uh, assigns uh, the mandate in the form of the list of tasks to a peacekeeping operation. It also sets a ceiling, the maximum size of the military and police component of the peacekeeping mission. And then usually yearly, sometimes every half a year, it revises uh, and amends the mandate. And we're looking at revised and amended mandates of peacekeeping operations because some missions uh, stay in the field for decades. For example, the UN mission in the Democratic Republic of uh, uh, the Congo uh, is now in its uh, 21st 
uh, 22nd, actually, 22nd year. So I think it's important to look at initial and amended mandates. And in terms of the process um, of peacekeeping negotiations, um, these negotiations uh, are led uh, by, in the contemporary era, they are led by one of the permanent members, one of the Western permanent members. So each um, uh, of those three Western members has a responsibility for a particular portfolio, for a particular conflict situation. For example, France is the lead on the peacekeeping operations in Mali, the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Lebanon. The US leads on uh, South Sudan and the UK uh, leads on Cyprus. And in order to adopt a peacekeeping resolution uh, and you are an amended peacekeeping mandate, uh, nine affirmative votes are necessary and no vetoes. And um, for most of the Cold War period, peacekeeping negotiations haven't been very contentious. Um, it was usually not very difficult to reach uh, consensus, of course, with some prominent exceptions like the missions uh, in the Balkans, which were quite contentious. Um, but uh, a trend in the recent period is that some of the more consensual tasks, like those related to human rights or the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, have become more and more contentious. Um, so we think that it's important to look at peacekeeping mandates, um, especially at the disaggregated level and the specific tasks which appear in new and revised peacekeeping resolutions. And um, uh, this was one of our motivations in creating this data set. Thank you, Xenia. Um, to add on what Xenia has already told you all, um, I would like to elaborate a little bit more on why we are motivated to study the content of peacekeeping mandates. And um, to add on what Xenia has already um, elaborated on, one other reason is that mandates have gotten a lot of attention from different stakeholders of UN peacekeeping operations lately. And this might be because of what Xenia has been already referring to. There is anecdotal evidence that suggests that mandates include many more and many more diverse tasks ranging, what Xenia has said, from security sector reform to election assistance to facilitating reconciliation with ordinary people on the ground. And there is a debate whether these increasingly complex mandates are a good thing or a bad thing. So on the one hand, uh, the UN Sec Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, um, pleaded, please put an end to mandates that look like Christmas trees. Christmas is over, he said, and the UN mission cannot possibly implement 209 mandated tasks. And he continued to say that these unrealistic demands due to the complexity of mandates put on peacekeeping operations will cost lives and will hurt the credibility of UN peacekeeping operations, as well as the UN as a whole. On the other hand, there are also arguments in favor of Christmas tree mandates, or at least not, not against Christmas tree mandates. Some scholars argue, for instance, that paring down peacekeeping mandates, so streamlining them and reducing the number of tasks and peacekeeping mandates, comes with a risk for peacekeepers, namely the risk of losing flexibility in their theater of operation, the um, flexibility of picking and choosing the tasks that deem most appropriate in a given situation. So despite this increasing attention and debate about the increasingly complex Christmas tree mandates, we actually have little systematic analysis of how mandates actually look like. Which tasks do UN Security Council mandates request from peacekeepers? How do number and composition of tasks change over time and vary across host countries of peacekeepers? And in our 
project, we seek to answer these questions by collecting data on the task in peacekeeping mandates and how they have changed over the lifespan of the missions. And of course, we are not the first ones to do so. There have been efforts to collect data on peacekeeping mandates. So there are the early quantitative study that broadly distinguish between traditional security focused missions. Um, a picture of that Xenia has shown you at the beginning. And on the other hand, multidimensional missions with mandates and mandated tasks that seek to transform the political, social, and economic environment in peacekeepers' host countries. Yet today, as Xenia has already said, most missions are multidimensional. So hence, we need more fine-grained data on mandated tasks in order to distinguish between the different types of multidimensional mandates and missions and take a closer look at what tasks multidimensional missions are actually mandated to carry out. Um, there have been efforts to collect data on these multidimensional tasks. For example, Govinda Clayton, Han Dorsen and Tobias Böhmelt have recently recorded some functions of peacekeepers, including election assistance and security sector reform. But the tasks that they coded in their UN Peace Initiatives data set are not comprehensive of all the tasks that peacekeeping mandates contain. And one reason for that is that they also look at other um, peace efforts and the mandates of other peace efforts, such as sanction committees, mediators, tribunals, and investigative bodies. And then there have been four studies that we could identify that focus specifically on the mandates of UN peacekeeping operations. However, they also only code a few selected tasks and they are by no means comprehensive of the 209 mandated tasks that Antonio Guterres identified in the Christmas tree mandates of today. Moreover, with the exception of the task assigned to mission mandates by Gabi Lloyd from 2020, all the existing efforts um, to collect data on peacekeeping mandates focus on initial mandates that establish a mission. And just they just capture a snapshot of, of the mission. They do not code how mandates evolve over the lifespan of mission deployment. And since, as Xenia has already mentioned, pe peacekeeping operation nowadays can stay for decades, we also want to know how their mandates change over the lifespan of the mission. So considering these existing efforts to collect data on peacekeeping operations, we think there are still three blind spots, spots and three contributions that we can make with our data set on peacekeeping mandates tasks. So first of all, um, existing efforts have not comprehensively recorded and um, the task and the task are at a high level of aggregation. For example, all existing peacekeeping mandate um, data sets only record security sector reform as one task, whereas our data set this, um, this aggregates security sector reform into six different tasks, namely police reform, military reform, justice sector reform, transitional justice, prison reform, and legal reform. Furthermore, um, our data set also codes the modalities of engagement with respect to the different tasks. Existing data sets all but ignore these modalities of engagement, ignore what exactly peacekeepers should do with respect to the task. And in contrast to that, our data set codes whether mandates request peacekeepers to monitor a given task or to assist with a given task or to secure a task. And we also distinguish whether mandates request, demand from peacekeepers to carry out the task or merely encourage the tasks. 
And finally, as already mentioned, um, our data set also codes variation over time, which is all but ignored in the existing efforts except in the data set by Gabi Lloyd. So we also, we do not only code initial UN Security Council resolutions, but also re resolutions that change the mandates of the peacekeeping operations. In total, we have coded 386 resolutions from 1991 to 2017 for 27 peacekeeping operations in Sub-Saharan Africa. And here you see um, the beginning of um, the initial UN Security Council resolution that established the currently youngest peacekeeping operation in the world, the operation in the Central African Republic. And this initial resolution reads that the UN Security Council decides to establish the United Nations multidimensional integrated stabilization mission in the Central African Republic as of the date of the adoption of this resolution for an initial period up to like one year. And then we also could a UN Security Council resolutions that extend the mandate of an existing resolution like the one shown here again from MINUSCA. And this resolution reads that the UN Security Council decides to extend the mandate of MINUSCA for another year. And finally, we could those mandates that change the content of the mandate of an existing operation, for example, this resolution here from 2016, which decided that the mandate of MINUSCA shall include the following immediate priority task. And this resolution then specifies a new set um, of tasks that should be the immediate uh, priority of, of the MINUSCA mission, for example, civilian protection and local reconciliation initiatives. We code from these resolutions a comprehensive set of tasks, and we have identified these tasks by a close initial reading of the mandates. And then based on our reading, we have continuously added to a list of tasks, and we arrived in total um, at 39 different tasks. And here you see a list of the mandated tasks we have coded. So we code tasks that seek to establish some level of agreement between belligerent parties, um, that a ceasefire and peace process assistance. We code humanitarian relief, including for refugees. We code tasks that are related to democratization and election processes. We code DDR tasks. We record tasks related to coercive peacekeeping. And of course, we called the cross-cutting tasks related to human rights and gender that the UN Secretariat want to see mainstreamed into all other tasks of the mission. Moreover, we called control of arms and demilitarization. And then we called a host of rule of law tasks, including security sector reform and also assistance to media and civil society. We also distinguish between five state authority extension tasks. And finally, we could tasks that aim at reconciliation and restoration of relations within society and relation between the host state and other states in the region. And after we had coded all these tasks from the resolutions, we realized that they neatly fit with the broader task categorization by Paul Deal and Daniel Druckmann. And we take this as an additional indicator for the validity of our coding scheme, that these tasks that we have identified actually resonate with what, with what scholars thinks, think are the relevant tasks in peacekeeping mandates. But yet again, you can see our coding, our categorization of tasks is much more fine-grained. For example, we have identified resolutions that only mandate disarmament and demobilization and other that also mandate um, reintegration and we distinguish these mandates. As already mentioned, we also code modalities of engagement. Are peacekeepers merely request to monitor a task, or are they also asked to assist with the task, or shall peacekeepers secure a task? So, for example, you see evidence from the UN Security Council re resolutions um, for all three modalities 
uh, with regards to the task of disarmament and demobilization. So evidence from a Security Council resolution for monitoring would read as follows, contribute to the implementation of the national program of disarmament, demobilization and reintegration by monitoring the disarmament. Or a UN Security Council resolution mandating peacekeepers to assist with DDR could read, request the Secretary General to appoint expediously a special representative who shall coordinate the overall support of the international community in Mali, including in the field of disarmament and demobilization. And evidence for securing a task such as disarmament demobilization could read to provide security in and at all sides of the disarmament demobilization and reintegration program. Beyond that, as already mentioned, we also distinguish between whether the UN Security Council resolution requested engagement in an area or just encouraged engagement. Before I've read out evidence for requests, here is also evidence for when the UN Security Council encourages the task, which reads calls upon UNMIS to coordinate with the government of the Republic of South Sudan to support disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration efforts. So calls up on here is the keyword for encouraged engagement by the peacekeepers in the DDR process. We have um, coded all resolutions ourselves and each resolution was coded twice. That means that two of us have read and recorded the task mentioned in these resolutions independently. And afterwards, we have then discussed our coding decisions and reconciled differences in our codings. And this means we are sure about the validity and reliability of our coding in accordance to our codebook. So overall, we think that our data quality is um, very high. And with that, I would like to hand over to Magnus, who will show you um, some descriptors of our data set. Uh, thank you very much, Hannah. Uh, so uh, building on what Xenia said about the background and what Hannah said about the, the motivation and the construction of the data, I'll, I'll present very briefly some of the content of the data, what it looks like to provide some uh, meat to these conceptual bones. And uh, it has been stressed, the data is comprehensive and, and, and finely granular, so it can be cut up in different ways. And I'm going to cut it up in, in two different ways, both uh, uh, focusing on macro patterns, so pertaining to variation across mission over long periods of time, but also pertaining to micro patterns, so variation within missions from resolution to resolution. And you'll see that both of these uh, cuts uh, show that there's considerable diversity in uh, mission mandates. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so first then turning to uh, macro patterns, this figure shows the content of uh, mission mandates at the point of mission establishment. Uh, so we have missions on the x-axis in the figure going from Minerso in 1991, that's the first mission that's coded in our data, all the way up to Minusca in 2014 when that mission was established. Uh, and then on the y-axis we have the different tasks. Uh, here, they are grouped into three larger categories, a category of uh, stability-related tasks, a, a category of peace-building, widely con con construed a related tasks, and a category of rights tasks. Uh, and if a particular mandate uh, of a mission at its establishment incorporates or specifies a given task, it's marked in dark gray. If it's not included in the mission mandate, it's marked in, in light gray. So this provides a, 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 a bird's eye overview of the development of peacekeeping mission mandates between 1991 and 2014. And in the paper, uh, we, uh, well, that goes with, with, the, with the data set, we have identified uh, three uh, macro patterns. Um, these are patterns that have been discussed in the literature before, so they're not necessarily novel insights, but what we can do on the basis of our data is to provide systematic data to support these insights and to, to show more exactly how they have played out. And the first is a growth in scope of mandates. This has already been referred to in this presentation. We see that mandates 
get longer and longer. They, they include more and more tasks. Whereas missions in the early uh, uh, part of our period, so in the early 90s, had a handful of tasks and someone, sometimes only one or two tasks. Missions uh, uh, established more recently, so after the turn of the millennium in particular, have 15 or 20 or sometimes even more tasks. So it's expansion of tasks or in the, in the number of tasks. And that uh, development is driven by, by two other trends or patterns, uh, which are also listed on this slide as number two and three. And the second one is we see an expansion of peacekeeping mandates into new policy areas, away in particular from, from the pre uh, or Cold War area, traditional type of peacekeeping. Uh, and this, uh, so we add, so, so the council, the Security Council is adding new tasks that were not uh, uh, included in earlier in the mandates of earlier missions. And this is, uh, relates in particular to uh, the enhancement of state capacity, to economic development, and to rights. You can see, for example, in the figure here, how rights-related tasks are nearly non-existent in the missions in the left-hand uh, half of the figure, but are routinely assigned to missions of more, a more recent mark. So those are the three macro patterns that emerge from our data, more tasks, newer tasks, and, and also the thirdly then I should say dis uh, disaggregation of tasks. So we see that tasks that were, uh, are, are split up into to, to a greater number of tasks. For example, security sector reform uh, has been split up into a, a number of more refined or more specific tasks, such as police reform or military reform. That's the third pattern. So those are the three macro patterns that we see in the data. Uh, if we turn to micro patterns, in the next slide, uh, we can uh, see what this looks like for specific missions. Again, because the PIMA data is so highly granular with observations on individual missions, resolution by resolution, we can do a similar type of analysis for individual missions to really get into the, to the uh, granular nature of how they evolve over time. And the figure here shows uh, the mandate or mandates, if you want, of the missions in the DRC, MUNUK and MONUSCO, MONUSCO being the follow on mission of MUNUK. Uh, from the first resolution 1279, which was adopted by the Council in November 1999, to uh, resolution 2348, which was adopted in March of 2017. Again, we have the tasks on the y axis. And again, we see that uh, the, the quite a lot of diversity over time in, in the tasks that the council wants this mission to carry out. Uh, and, and this reflects then how the, the council has negotiated mandate and then renegotiated it. And in through this extension also amends the mandate, adding tasks, dropping tasks, sometimes replacing one task with another task and so on. And we have identified, if we uh, go to the next slide, which is just an add on onto this slide, uh, six different phases that this mission goes through. You can def cut this differently, but we identify six phases um, uh, to then categorize the development over time. In the first phase, uh, MUNUK was a very small mission, few, uh, few personnel and only a, a very short list of core tasks. And it has then in reflection of negotiations in the Security Council evolved through these different phases. Uh, with the, the uh, mandate stipulated by council changing as a response to that. You can see, for example, uh, between uh, phase two and three, uh, how the council adds a number of tasks. For example, justice sector reform is added uh, in phase three and then dropped in phase four, only to reemerge again in phase five. So the takeaway here is that there's quite a lot of longitudinal variation within missions adding to the diversity of variation that we saw in the previous slides of variation across missions. Um, so uh, if we are interested in diversity in mission mandates, which we should be, and we think is a, a, is a relevant research topic for various reasons, this type of data is an important resource. And I'll hand over to Jessica now to tell you more, more specifically what the data can be used for. Thank you. Thank you very much. So in case you're still wondering why this data is useful, why you need data on UN mission mandates, notwithstanding, I think, the very convincing point that Senia, uh, Hannah, and Magnus have already raised. Uh, so I mean, let, me, let me maybe mention a couple that we think, uh, a couple of research strands that we think will particularly benefit from this data. And so to begin with, uh, 
probably the one of the most obvious to those that study peacekeeping operations and their impact on the ground concerns the possibility of thinking of mandate as documents that design specific conflict management tools. So if you think of peacekeeping as a conflict management tool, you may want to see which are the different components of that tool that allow the tool to ultimately work or fail. Right. So you can think of different uh, different different um, uh, aspects of peacekeeping you may want to study and more specifically, actually different reasons to focus on the mandates of these peacekeeping operations. For example, you can think of the possibility that the fact that a single task is included in a mandate may be itself a signal of commitment. Right. So it may just show that the UN or the international community or the troop contributing countries are more committed to those specific tasks, which in turn suggests that um, missions that are equipped with different mandates may perform differently on the ground. I think this is a question that ultimately requires, um, we, would, we could say, an empirical answer in the sense that you can assume that mandates make a difference, but you need to maybe, you may want to verify that, you may want to check whether that's the case and whether this inclusion of a specific task alters the performances of the missions on the ground. And finally, we also acknowledge, of course, the possibility that peacekeepers may go beyond uh, the mandated task or may not perform at all what's in their mandate. But we also think that because of the reasons that uh, Xenia mentioned when she described how these documents are negotiated, the role of the pen holders, there's still a degree of legitimacy attached to this document and the expectations that peacekeepers on the ground in a way will stick to the mandates. And again, this is another type of question that needs to be uh, studied more uh, empirically and for which you do need this type of data. You need to understand why you, you need to um, you need the level of granularity that allows you to really see whether this makes any difference on the ground and also whether that affects the even the perceived legitimacy of the actions that peacekeepers do uh, on the ground, particularly when we think about tasks that may be perceived as particularly intrusive because maybe they deal with political reforms, uh, the presence of experts and advisors that um, are usually work assist the government. So for some tasks, we believe that these elements, this element of um, legitimacy is particularly relevant. And so this is the first trend of research that, uh, that we think will particularly benefit from the data. There's also another one, which relates, however, on, which relates to uh, the study of international relations, international organizations uh, as a whole. So again, to reiterate the point, mandates are the result of negotiations and looking at what ends up in a mandate it does tell you something about maybe the whole negotiation process and maybe also the normative priorities and the trends that may exist in international organizations. Of course, in this case, we're focusing specifically on the UN case, which is maybe for many the paramount international organizations. So this, I think, can also give you an insight into which are, yes, these normative priorities. Think about tasks that were never mentioned in the past, like Magnus has mentioned, so the introduction of human rights in the mandate as a task that we see more and more often included in these documents. And in addition, you can also consider evaluating internal and external factors that shapes the debate and ultimately the design of the finally authorized mandates. And also the relationship between the different bureaucracies within the UN, because the whole negotiation process also involves recommendations by the Secretary General that goes to the Security Council. And uh, Magnus and Xenia have this very interesting paper on global governance. Where they see at the conditions at how likely the Security Council is to accept those recommendations. And without knowing what ends up in a mandate, you really cannot do that type of research and you cannot really reveal the, the, those patterns and these dynamics that exist that are, that are specific to um, international organizations. Now, what do we do with PIGMA though? So in, a, in, in the working paper, we, we examine an existing study uh, that focuses on the first strand of research, so peacekeeping effectiveness, so to speak. Do peacekeeper save lives? And more specifically, we will examine uh, this work on the American Journal of Political Science by uh, Lisa Altman, Jacob Kaplan, and Megan Shannon. It was published in 2013. And ultimately, the conclusion of the paper is that sizable deployment of UN of armed UN peacekeepers, so military presence, visible military presence by the UN, saves uh, civilian lives on a monthly basis. So you see a reduction in the number of civilians that get killed in host states when there is a sizable presence of, um, of armed peacekeepers, ultimately. So this is the finding uh, of the paper. And we just ask another question on top of that. We ask, do mandates make any difference on the ground? So do we see any difference if we try to understand? It's possible, for example, that um, uh, if, a, if, if a mandate 
allows peacekeep allow peacekeepers to protect civilians explicitly, this gives legitimacy to more proactive actions that peacekeepers may sometimes need to take uh, when they need to offensively, for example, react, uh, off offensively uh, take action against violence and violations perpetrated against civilians. Or in addition, the presence of the task may itself deter escalation because it signals the willingness uh, to respond. And finally, exactly because FEMA allows us to make the distinction between uh, monitoring and actively protecting civilians, uh, we, we are also able to see whether the, the mere inclusion of the task as a token is enough or whether you need to ask peacekeepers, require peacekeepers to actively protect civilians on the ground. And this is definitely one thing that uh, FEMA allows us to do. So a few things that I would like to point out in our re which is not a replication exactly because we aim at looking at something that is different. We rely on that paper as our baseline, so to speak, and then we add something else on top of that, which is why we ultimately re-examine re um, those findings. So Uthman, Katman and Shandon, in fact, did include uh, in one of their models a measure of, P of POC, protection of civilian mandates. However, they do so by only coding whether that was included in the mandate that authorized the mission in the first place. So basically, basically, there's no information on temporal changes. For example, whether the mandate was in, the, um, the task was included at later stages, for example. So that information is basically uh, is basically lost. It's a variable that never changes. It's a constant for all the missions that they have in their sample. And in relation to the sample, we exclude exclude Binut and Unoa because these are special political missions, which we do not include in our sample. That is. A sample of peacekeeping operations. So for the moment, this is, these are those that we are coding. And the reason why this, this, these missions actually end up in their data set is because at some point they do host troops, which means that they end up in the data set and so they have it there for, for this reason. Um, so what we want to explain with this model is whether including POC tasks related to uh, P protection of civilian in mandates changes the number of civilians that get killed on a monthly basis using the UCDP data. So the model is exactly the same as the one that they proposed. We use exactly their specification with the only difference that we add another variable, which is protection of civilian mandates, as I said. And we code this in a couple of different ways. So we first just code whether the mission includes, whether the mandate includes at a certain point in time, a task to, um, a task to protect civilian, um, a task for the mission to actively protect civilians. So they need to be requested to either assist the government in protecting civilians or to protect civilians regardless of what the government decides to do. And so this is a distinction that our levels of engagement and strength of the provision allow us to make. And we further play with the distinction by coding other two variables with this, which distinguish protection of civilians that is active, which means the mission again is similar to what I just said, basically. So the mission is requested to act to protect civilians and passive protection of civilians, where the mission is asked to either monitor uh, civilians, uh, the whether they are yeah, just monitor if any violations or monitor and report oftentimes whether any violations occur against civilians, or encourages the mission to protect civilians or vulnerable vulnerable groups. So it's a more uh, soft, uh, softer provision, we would say. So this is how we measure that. And just to give you an overview of our main findings. So here you can see the different effects of the different variables included in our models. On top, you have UN troops. So this, the, uh, the, 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 dash, the dash line, uh, uh, it's basically it's centered at zero. So everything that is on the left side suggests that that variable has a negative effect, meaning it reduces civilian killings. So it's a good thing because it saves lives. Everything that is on the right hand side suggests that actually the opposite is happening. However, if anything crosses the, red, the, the dotted line, it just means that you cannot conclude anything because the results are basically statistically non-significant. You cannot distinguish the effect from zero. That's the ultimate understanding here. So if you just give a glance at this graph, what you can see is that UN troops, as, it, as the main finding of HKS suggests, seems to reduce violence against civilians on a monthly basis. So this finding remains. Uh, and you can only also see that the protection of civilian, the, the, the row two and three, where we compare the way HKS uh, measure that and how we measure that with Pima, are pretty similar in size. They do not change substantively, really. The key difference uh, really materialized when to distinguish passive and active peacekeeping. It seems that most of the, of the job here is made by 
like actively asking these people to protect civilians. So it's not enough to just add uh, tasks that refer to protection of civilians to make a difference on the a difference on the ground ultimately. And as an additional uh, set of models that we show, we also distinguish one-sided violence perpetrated by the government and perpetrated by the rebels. And here we, so we don't want to overinterpret this because we just want to re-examine um, the baseline paper that the, the paper by HKS, but we just want to briefly maybe uh, also draw this distinction here. So just to summarize this very quickly, if you look at the rebel side on the, on the, yeah, the violent side here, uh, rebel sponsored violence, it's still reduced by the presence of UN troops. So military presence seems to deter violence against civilians uh, perpetrated by the rebels but mandates do not really seem to make a difference anymore, which might make sense if you want to think of rebels maybe not being necessarily aware of the content of the mandate, or maybe because they do need to, to have a visible military, sizable military deployment to, act, to actually be deterred uh, and not use violence against civilians. So this is a possible interpretation, of course. We do not exactly know whether this is the case, but if we ask me how we, how we, we interpret that, this would be, I think, our, uh, our answer. And the opposite happens when you focus on the government, on the left-hand side. So you see that troops here really cross the dashed line, which means that governments are not necessarily deterred by the presence of large military deployments, but they do reduce their reliance on one-sided violence, so violence against civilians, when the mandate includes provisions to uh, protect civilians. And more specifically, when you disaggregate passive and active protection of civilians, you see again that actively protecting civilians, provision of this type included in the mandate, reduces the, uh, the, lack, the, the number of civilians that get killed by the government, but just including act, uh, passive protection of civilians, hence a less robust version of that, we could say, seems to actually backfire in a way. And let me tell you that while, while this may sound surprising, this is actually in line with other findings suggesting that when UN deploys observers, which are not armed, the violence perpetrated by the government tends to increase. So you can think of the deployment of observers that are unarmed and ultimately not really a military deterrent, something maybe that it's doing the same thing as just asking, encouraging uh, peacekeepers to protect civilians. So very briefly to summarize, uh, it seems that based on this re-examination, the violence reducing effect of protection of civilian mandates is largely due to the active protection of civilian tasks presented in the mandate. And rebels seems more responsive to military deployments than to the content compared to the content of the mandate. Well, the opposite seems to be true uh, for government. And we do have also these interesting findings for the disaggregate passive and active uh, protection of civilians. So maybe to conclude, let me mention maybe another couple of uh, ongoing work that some of us are, um, uh, are, um, are carrying out at the moment that I think would have really wouldn't have been possible without Pima ultimately. So it's really something that only uh, was made possible by the fact that this data became available at some point, so that we collected it. So uh, with, with Anna Schmidt here and uh, Rob Blair from the University of Brown, we're working on this paper that looks at the conditions that allows peacekeeper operations to actually carry out the very same activities that they are mandated with. So basically we try to see what, what enables peacekeepers to match the ambitions of the mandate and the activities that they then carry out on the ground. In another paper with Katja Coleman, uh, Ksenia Oksamitna and uh, Sabine Otto, a uh, very newborn idea where we try to look at whether this new mandate that seems to be more civilian oriented, at least in the tasks that they include, are also matched with similar resources on the ground. So whether that corresponds to the type of staff that the UN is willing to invest in. So do they hire more civilian staff? Is the civilian staff more likely to be deployed to those missions that do have those civilian oriented uh, tasks? And finally, uh, another paper by um, Anna Schmidt with Sabine Otto and Constantine Brew, where they look more specifically at human rights activities. Uh, and uh, the, um, again, what makes peacekeepers more likely to engage with activities. And they formulate this idea that it's possible that, of course, having a mandate to do so may increase the possibility that it's happened. But it's also important to look at how the mandate as a whole look like. So whether there's a space actually for peacekeepers to carry out those specific tasks. And I will leave it there. Thank you so much for uh, your interest and uh, we look forward for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much to uh, Jessica, Magnus and Hannah for their fantastic presentation. Um, I hope that it was quite comprehensive 
showing showing us what this data can do, uh, how it can be used, and how it can further our understanding of um, peacekeeping. Um, we have 40 minutes for questions and answers, uh, which is really great. I know that unfortunately Magnus will have to leave us at some point because he has another meeting, which was impossible to move. But we will try to pick up all the questions uh, that you might have. And I will start with questions in the Q&A box. Please use the Q&A box to post them. And then and, uh, I'll move on to the chat uh, to pick up some questions there. So um, in terms of the questions in the Q&A box, um, there is a question about uh, mine action. So uh, mine action related tasks such as humanitarian demining, explosive ordnance risk education and others fall into which category? Does anyone want to pick up this question? Uh, if I may just say very briefly, there is a demining category which would capture uh, some of these, uh, at least that would be a first part of the answer. I'm not sure if Hannah or, or Jessica uh, would have a better sense of whether the uh, explosive and ordnance uh, risk reduction and so on would fall into any other uh, category than that. And I think this is correct. These are included in the, the mining uh, section. So yes, this is where I will look at. And again, for all of those, you will have the three different levels of engagement. And most of the, so in, I'm not sure whether you can have that being encouraged. So I don't think we should be encouraged to work on that. More likely, they will probably assist the government in doing that and maybe provide security to locations where this is taking place. But that would be the category to look at. Uh, right? Where I cannot see now. On this, yeah, but it, it's there. It's the demand option um, uh, task. Mm -hmm. OK. So uh, the next question is posed by Enrique. And uh, uh, he's asking the following. Does Pima also register a UN Security Council support for each resolution? Uh, for example, which member state voted for, against, or abstained? And uh, maybe I'm going to answer this question because I touched upon Security Council decision making at the beginning of the presentation. Um, so we look at uh, mandated tasks. We do not look at the voting record in uh, this project. And our reason for not doing so was because um, peacekeeping mandate negotiations in the post-Cold War period were quite consensual. And uh, um, they are very rarely vetoed. Um, I can really um, think of only the example of the UN preventative deployment in Macedonia, which was vetoed by China for reasons unrelated to the mission itself, because Macedonia recognized uh, Taiwan and China decided to veto that operation. But in general, um, the vast majority of peacekeeping uh, resolutions are adopted by consensus. And um, um, while uh, we were talking, I've quickly look at uh, the voting record uh, for the, the past year. And we do see some abstentions, um, but we do not see negative votes on peacekeeping resolutions. We had Russia abstain on the resolutions in the DRC, the Western Sahara, uh, and the support mission in uh, Syria. But I mean, sometimes those abstentions uh, are related not to the content of peacekeeping mandates, but rather to the process of negotiations. Some countries would express disappointment that they weren't consulted enough or the process was too hasty. Um, so our reason for not looking at this is because we don't see much variation and then it's not always related to the content of peacekeeping mandates, which is our primary interest. Okay, then we have uh, the question from Jenna. Do you attempt to categorize missions into types based on their mandated tasks? For example, observer or multidimensional. Can you briefly discuss the pros and cons of attempting to do this? Does anyone want to answer this question? Yeah, I think I can give it a try. So the benefit of our data is that we try to disaggregate these multidimensional mandates and missions into them. Um, so what Xenia alluded to, um, 
multidimensional mandates with a few type of mission. So um, after the 1990, um, when our data set starts, we actually in our data set, um, where we only see these multidimensional missions that include tasks that try to transform the political, economic, and social environment in the host country. However, now we could think of um, coming up with different types of broader categorization based on the mandated tasks that you find in our PIMA data set. So uh, what uh, Xenia alluded to at the beginning, the distinction between increasingly robust missions that um, are also mandated to use force targeting particular non-state actors in the country could be one marker of distinction from the earlier multidimensional um, missions. So I think what we need to do here and what we can do based on our data is to think about maybe other broader categories of, of missions now. Can I add very briefly on, on top of what Anna said? I think maybe related relates more to the um, pitfalls of doing that. I mean, I, th I think what, 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 what this data allow you to do is to really think more about what you mean with multidimensional, for example. So I think with, with the paper with Rob Blair and Hannah that, I, that I've mentioned before, we, we have been thinking about that. So we've been thinking about what multidimensional really means because sometimes it seems to be just about the number of tasks that are included in a mandate rather than the variety of tasks that peacekeepers have to do. So the civilian component, the peace building component, and all these different things that are really ultimately even carried out by different types of personnel. So I think when you, when you have all these 39 different tasks, it really pushes you more into thinking about what, what, what's the best way, not necessarily the best, but what, what's the way that makes most sense to you to classify these operations. Oftentimes, this depends on what you want to study, what you want to research on. Um, and also with the observers, right? With the observers, what do we mean with observers missions? Are those only missions that only have observers that are as personnel deployed? So this has, not, this has nothing to do with the mandate itself. I mean, it does have something to do with the mandate, of course, but you see, it's just a different way of thinking about how we differentiate missions with each other, uh, from each other. And so, I think the good, the good news is that the data allows you that flexibility to, to make the classification. I think that is, um, and also makes you think a little bit more about the one that makes more sense to you. Great, thanks. Thanks, Hannah and Jessica. So um, the next question is about uh, concepts of operations. Would you have any insight on the developments in the concepts of operations, CONOPS, over time. I wonder if earlier missions with less mandated tasks still had similar implied tasks in the CONOPS. Um, I can probably try to answer this question. And uh, um, I, I guess that um, uh, it's pretty much impossible to look at concepts of operations because they are internal documents and uh, they're not publicly available. And I actually wonder how systematic their archiving um, has been. And uh, for uh, ongoing missions, it would be impossible to get these documents from the UN because they are related to the security of the operation. Um, and they're definitely covered by very stringent confidentiality uh, procedures. Um, I mean, uh, maybe, especially for some, for some of the Cold War missions, um, concepts of operations, uh, were important documents. But I think in uh, um, the post-Cold War missions, the mandates are quite specific and quite detailed, and um, they usually define what peacekeeping missions do. Uh, while concepts of operations, they usually refer to how the force is deployed as opposed to what they do. For example, the regional distribution, uh, the type of bases that uh, military peacekeepers uh, work from, um, so um, we haven't looked at the concepts of operations and um, I think that due to data availability, it would be very difficult. Um, yeah. May I add to this? Um, so um, I think this question is, is very good because it hints at a, another question, namely how much of these mandates 
mandates is actually implemented on the ground? To which extent are these mandates dictating what peacekeepers are doing on, on the ground? And this is a question that we are all interested in and, and that Jessica Di Salvatore and Rob Blair from Brown University and I tried to explore in this paper under what conditions do peacekeepers implement the man mandated tasks? And for this, we have also coded what tasks are actually implemented by the peacekeepers on the ground. So from, from the tasks that you find in the mandate, which ones are actually carried out? And what, what we see is that the share of the implemented task um, from, from the mandated task, the share of, of the tasks that are actually implemented has not um, increased or, or decreased very, very much over time um, when controlling for uh, levels of violence and mandate fragmentation. So, yeah, maybe that, that adds a little bit to, to this questions, question, do earlier missions maybe carry out um, some tasks that are, are not um, written into the mandate that's that's something we cannot really answer, but what we see is that er, earlier missions um, also quite closely try to um, follow what is written into their mandate, except under conditions of violence or when, when the mandate is really complex and fragmented. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks, Anna. Um, so oh, um, we also have a comment and then a question. And the comment is, thank you for your hard work reading all this UN Security Council resolutions. Well, <laughs> thank you for thanking us. Um, it was indeed a big investment of time. And the question is, do you expect any of your conclusions to change if you expanded this data set uh, to the time before 1999, back to 1947, and beyond missions in Africa? If I, if I think it's maybe something about that, uh, so if this relates to the results on uh, civilian killings, so on whether peacekeepers manage to protect civilians, I'm not sure because we are relying on an analysis that just uses a more restricted sample, so they're not using data that goes that back in time, if that's what the question refers to. However, that refers on the other hand to the patterns in the mandated task, the ones that Magnus has illustrated, I think we might see more parse mandates if we go back in time that would be my expectations but beyond africa i think it, it may be it may be particularly interesting so if we think about again recent missions but beyond africa i think it would be interesting to see if there's actually something going on in terms of a regional approach that the un tries to um tries to have for these peacekeeping operations so whether of course keeping things constant uh, as much as you can. So thinking the levels of violence constant and other factors that are specific to the context where they intervene, whether you do see, still seem to be a, to, to identify a regional approach. Uh, but this implies going beyond the sample that we have ge geographically. So there would be, I think, my answer when it comes to going beyond the geographical scope. For the temporal trends, I think we would just see sparser operations, so with fewer um, tasks um, and data. That would be my short answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. So um, the next question is by Babu. And uh, the question is as follows. Do you look at cooperation with or support for national or third party forces? We don't we do not code that information. So we do not code from the, so the resolutions do include sometimes the request for the mission to coordinate with other missions in the region, for example. And this is not information that we code, we specify in the, in the, um, in the code book, which is the information we look for, which is most of the times things that the mission have to do in relation to the government. So we exclude things that, I think by definition, if, correct me if I'm missing it, but I think the, it is one of the rules that we set in the in the in the things that we call. So we remove this element of regional corporations or third parties. So we mostly call actions directed towards the government or that let's say directed towards the whole state, not necessarily. Yes, the exactly. 
Um, there is um, a data collection effort by Lisa Holtman and Corinne Barra on regional peacekeeping operations and their data set um, could easily be merged with the Pima data set in order to allow a first exploration of um, to which extent regional peacekeeping forces cooperate with UN peacekeeping forces. Okay, great, thanks. Now we have a few questions about protection of civilians. So Walt is asking uh, whether the strength of the wording uh, for protection of civilians mandates is um, uh, so he's wondering how it, how it is measured, because these mandates have evolved from being very timid initially and have progressively become much more robust over time in some context. So Walt is wondering how the strength is measured. And if you want to, did you want to go ahead? Okay. Yeah. So. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. So the first thing, which is basically our coding scheme, we do code where the mandate to protect civilians is um, something that a mission has to assist the government uh, in doing that, or they have to do it that themselves, regardless whether the government wants to work with them or not. Uh, monitoring and encouragement. So the other four category, but it's true that oftentimes the paragraphs where the UN mandates protection of civilians tends to be very long and Details also include different references to other, 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 I think there are other linguistic formulas that they use uh, in those paragraphs that I think may allow you to look more into the strength beyond the engagement categories that we have identified. For example, the use of all necessary means, that, that is something that, by the way, we code in Pima. So we also have an additional variable, which, yeah, it, 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 you can see it in the first column, use of force. So that sometimes is mentioned in the same paragraph for protection of civilian is mandated. And since in the raw data, we identify the paragraphs exactly where that task is mandated. If you combine, I think it's possible in principle to see, for example, what is how, how let's say maybe not comprehensive, but how many vulnerable populations is protection of civilian covering here? Sometimes it's a very general local population sometimes they refer to idps they refer to refugees uh, they refer to humanitarian actors and i think if you if you if you use that information on the specific paragraphs and look at what other things are mentioned in relation to protection of civilians maybe they would allow you to go uh, to, to, to get a little bit of that strength it's not necessarily the strength in the wording i think but i think it may highlight the relevance of that specific task for the UN, for the Security Council. Uh, sometimes they also mention that these tasks should be given immediate priority, uh, which is something we, in fact, we do not really code in the, uh, in the data, but I think it makes it easier to go back to that specific paragraph and see if that type of language is used if you want to dig deeper uh, into that. But if you just want to use the raw data as it is, I think the cross references uh, of the different tasks in the same paragraph would maybe allow you to capture some of that, I would say. Yes, just just to briefly add to this, so we have a raw data version available where we have um, recorded the exact paragraph number. So it would be easily easy to go to search through the column of civilian protection tasks, um, identify the paragraphs in the resolutions, and then um, check whether these resolutions um, code civilian protection with priority or without civilian protection more comprehensively directed at different types of actors or more narrowly at um, some, some more narrow category of um, actors. Mm -hmm. And we have a question related to that, so I would like to take it now. Uh, Oishin is asking, um, does the approach to modalities capture moments when the Security Council explicitly prioritizes tasks? If not, is there a risk that the granular nature of the data might miss the wood for the trees? The true focus of the mission might be on a much smaller set of tasks than the list of mandated tasks implies. I mean, if I may start, um, in terms of um, designating specific tasks as a priority, it's also a very recent practice. And um, it's maybe the last two or three years when a few missions um, have had some tasks designated 
it as a priority. But then sometimes they have a list of priorities. And I think in the end, they ended up having, you know, uh, six, seven main priorities covering pretty much all the tasks. So um, um, I wonder how much additional information uh, priori prioritization would have given us. Yeah, the, the recent HIPPO report um, from, from um, the UN has um, pleaded to have more prioritized and more sequenced mandates due, due to this problem. And what we read in the Security Council resolutions is that actually only civilian protection has recently become an immediate priority task. Um, but we do not really see, also when we look at the patterns and trends in the data, that um, this, the scope of the mandate has been reduced. And, and from the mandate language, we also cannot really identify that there is any kind of implied sequence or implied priorities um, um, in these tasks. But we think that is hopefully a, a trend where uh, UN mission mandates will, will be heading. Um, as we know, like from, from anecdotal evidence, it is um, difficult for mission staff to figure out what task, if they have to pick and choose what task should be the priority. Um, Okay, thank you, Hannah. Um, we do have a few more questions on the protection of civilians. Um, given the breadth of POC issues, um, how have you disaggregated POC tasks? Does it cover the traditional POC tasks, such as protection from harm, or wider, such as uh, famine prevention, access issues, and um, um, protection from sexual exploitation and abuse, and women, peace, and security? So if I can say a few words about that, um, the useful thing, I think we structured the codebook in a way that I think clarifies many of these, or many, many, many points you might have on how the coding actually was done, because we also identify instances that might sound like something that should have been coded, but ultimately we do not code that. So we try to be very explicit on what we code there. And when it comes to POC, uh, we, I think if this is a traditional POC task, this is how we code that, protection from uh, harm. and. Also, because I think this more specific, for example, when it comes to sexual exploitation, oftentimes this is referred in terms of uh, due diligence within the mission. And so, as I mentioned before, we do not code tasks that relate to other actors within the UN mission. So if the mission is requested to make sure that uh, peacekeepers do certain things in terms, for example, their own behavior, if that makes sense, that regulates their own behavior, we do not code that information. Uh, however, if the mandate prefers to, and I'm referring to against to the uh, SEA more generally, sometimes the mandates refer to provide protection against sexual violence. So here, of course, it's implied that that would occur, would be perpetrated by non peacekeepers actors. Uh, that's information that we code. But again, uh, we do not, I think we do not have a category that codes things that the Security Council request the sector general to report on and that refers to what happens within the mission if that makes sense so i, I it's it, so in this case it's not necessarily within the mission because of course it involves uh, interactions with civilians and with the local populations uh, but when it's requested to monitor on certain things that the mission should be doing this is not, not a task that falls within our uh, definition of task coded in the man in a data set at least if that makes sense but any other reference to vulnerable relations that need to be protected, and they are, for example, in IDP camps, this is defined by a different category. So it's the, the security provision for refugees, for example. So we have a separate set uh, of, um, I think, of variables that could, of, yeah, of mandated tasks that I think would speak to that, uh, not only traditional POC mandates, if that makes sense. Yeah, in essence, I think human rights, children rights, sexual and gender based violence, as well as the securing categories or the securing modalities of engagement in humanitarian relief and refugees. These are the wider civilian protection task and in civilian protection, we try to stick to the mandate language as closely as possible and reduce 
arbitrary interpretation by ourselves and code this when it's the resolution actually states uh, civilian protection. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah and Jessica. And now we have uh, two um, very interesting questions by Josh. So the first question relates to the disaggregation of tasks. Pima codes 39 tasks, but was the Secretary General exaggerating when he said there can be 2000, oh, 200, not 2000, 209 peacekeeping tasks? Um, is there a space for further disaggregation? Yeah, I think that that then goes back to um, what a previous Tashin um, Oshin said about not seeing the the forest um, due to the number of trees. Um, there's possibly further room for further um, disaggregation, especially since mandates will evolve right in the future and they will add um, other tasks. Um, so we, we had so many iterations <laughs> in uh, getting to this list, list of 39 different tasks and we think these um, are the most sensical and especially if we want to reduce the scope of our own interpretation. Um, but we think like in the future, it might be worthwhile to look at um, further disaggregation, for example, in, in the use of force or offensive operations, if this is the direction that UN peacekeeping operations will go to, or um, to look further into um, local reconciliation activities, distinguish between with what type of actors the UN peacekeepers are mandated to do reconciliation activities, local population or more traditional authorities, and at what level. I think there's some scope to some further disaggregation. But here again, we can refer to our raw data set where uh, we have also coded the paragraph numbers, I think, where it would be easy to um, seek out further inter um, disaggregation in one particular type of task. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hannah. And uh, uh, Josh has also made a comment uh, that uh, um, um, in terms of further disaggregation of uh, protection of civilians tasks, that some missions have been tasked with establishing and strengthening early warning systems uh, that alert the mission to um, uh, of threats to civilians. And uh, um, in our data set, we do not code um, any language uh, in which uh, the Security Council might indicate how a peacekeeping mission might uh, go about a specific task, um, because sometimes um, the Security Council can be quite prescriptive. They say, you know, missions should establish community alert networks. Uh, they should uh, engage with the local population, establish trust. Uh, but all those are means of implementing uh, our protection of uh, civilians mandated task. And then Josh also has another question about active versus passive POC language. Is it possible that the mandate language is correlated with the capabilities of the mission uh, or some other political factors? For example, rather than the mandate language influencing the government's decision to commit one-sided violence, could a context where government one-sided violence is occurring influence the council, council's decision to include active POC language? I think this is very likely, this is very possible. And it's also possible that maybe um, escalation of government violence occurs just before the month. I think Jessica is breaking up. Is, is Jessica back? Sorry, can you hear me? I think my connection, okay, I blacked out for a second. Uh, it's Possible, yeah. It's, it's that my connection is a stable, a stable. Apologies if I something goes wrong again. But I think this is very likely, and it's also possible that the government will maybe escalate violence just before uh, the mandate for actively protecting civilians is authorized. Exactly because it knows in advance that something is coming, right? So there are these um, escalation, the escalation dynamics that have been picked up 
uh, in the work that look at things that governments can foresee, can anticipate, because they know the UN is for, because I mean, these mandates are negotiated over some time. They do not come out of the blue, right? So governments know that some negotiations might be going on. They may be involved themselves in some of the tasks that needs to be authorized in the mandate, which means that uh, in a way that anticipates what's coming or maybe in mm. yes jessica's connection is not very stable at the moment let's see if it becomes better Or we can go to the next question and then see when Jessica com comes back, whether she can finish her answer to the, the other question. Yes, yes, this is a good suggestion, Hannah, thank you. Uh, so we have a question from Tigist. Um, and um, the question is about both women, peace and security agenda and the protection of civilians. Um, so, uh, um, the comment is, I think it will be interesting to see the increasing inclusion of the women, peace and security agenda in mandates and see any linkages in implementation of mandates. And the question about the POC, could individual mission approaches uh, also be a factor in POC mandate implementation? As there are considerable number of missions mandated under chapter seven of the charter and yet are less inclined to use force thereby reducing physical protection tier of the POC mandate. I'm happy to take this question, but now Jessica is back. So maybe Jessica can finish the answer to the former question. Uh, it's, no, it was, uh, I think it was, I hope the idea was, was clear or did I, I, I don't know what, at which point the connection broke down, but broke down, but I, I think, think just yes. the last sentence or so. Uh, yeah, just the fact that government made them be part of those negotiations so they can definitely anticipate and have a more strategic behavior when it comes to how they want to use violence against civilians in particular. I will, I will stop there, sorry. Yeah, with, with regards to the question by Tigis Melka, um, I think this is a very, th these are two very interesting questions and they relate again to the peacekeeping as a conflict management tool. Uh, this is also a purpose for why we have created um, these data um, and I think um, it would be fruitful to merge um, our mandate data with another data set on what the peacekeepers do on the ground in order to evaluate it, to what extent a mandated sexual um, uh, violence and gender-based violence tasks and also gender mainstreaming um, tasks which are mandated are actually implemented on the ground and by merging um, the PIMA data set with um, this data I think you could evaluate um, to what extent but also in which ways um, the mission is actually implementing um, the mandated task and um, the data comes with um, um, this paper here by Blea Di Salvatore and myself. Okay, thanks, Hannah. And um, I think we've been very efficient and we have only one last question uh, left in the Q&A box. Does the increased specificity of mandates also correlate with higher strategic guidance and oversight uh, by the UN headquarters? Or conversely, with less freedom uh, for um, special representatives of the Secretary General, Force Commanders and uh, Police Commissioners? And I think it's a very, very interesting question. Um, and it, indeed, we have seen the expansion of peacekeeping mandates. And in parallel, the UN headquarters have produced uh, guidance. So now we have operational policy and guidelines on protection of civilians, gender, um, civil affairs. So we do see the production of more guidance. Um, and I guess the question about whether it influences strategic autonomy of senior peacekeeping leaders in the field is an empirical question. Um, but my impressions from interviewing UN officials was that there is a degree of resentment against uh, this long and wide and unmanageable <laughs> peacekeeping mandate. 
Um, and very often uh, senior officials, senior leaders um, uh, try to figure out themselves uh, what is the most appropriate approach uh, to a peacekeeping mandate. And uh, one of my interviewees had actually said like, oh, the Christmas, uh, it was a Christmas tree mandate with all the tinsel. So uh, various uh, small tasks, they would just see it as tinsel. They would say like our core goal was electoral security. We were securing the elections. Uh, this is what we were doing. And of course it would be nice to also promote human rights and inter-ethnic reconciliation. But I think um, um, senior leaders do take their own approaches to peacekeeping mandates. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I think this has been a fantastic presentation and I would like to thank you all for your attention, uh, for your questions. Uh, we hope we have managed to answer all of them and uh, our data set is publicly available. I think there is a link in our presentation uh, to a Google site uh, where the data is hosted. So we encourage you to explore it. We encourage you to use it. Um, we hope it will be helpful for your future research projects on various aspects of peacekeeping, diplomacy, um, security, civil wars. Um, yeah, Maybe very Jessica? Quickly. So it's going to be posted on the website. It's not yet there, but uh, we're going to post it. It's the code book is there. It's anonymous for uh, reasons that you can imagine, but the data will be posted there as well. Okay. As yeah. soon as possible. Do we have like a timeline? Is it a matter of weeks or months or? I think it's a matter of maybe one week or so, probably. Okay. Uh, but um, in any case, if you, if whenever you check that it is not available, feel free to get in touch with either of us. Yes. Any of, of the four of us would be fine. Yes. We were happy to email uh, the data to you if you get in touch. Um, all right. I would like to thank um, Hannah and Jessica and Magnus, who had to leave, uh, for this fantastic presentation. And thank you all for your engagement, uh, for your questions. It has really inspired us to think about some new avenues uh, of research based on uh, the peacekeeping mandates data. Yeah, thank you for your interest. Thanks for the great question. And thanks, Xenia, for moderating this. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, I totally second Anna's comment. Yes, uh, please enjoy your afternoon. And uh, the recording of this uh, presentation will be available online. Okay, bye everyone. Bye everyone. Thank you.